Welcome to our first view dealing with Soren Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling. And of course, before we can get into Fear and Trembling, we need to recognize that Rene Descartes, who we looked at in an earlier video, really initiated the era of system builders. Uh, following in his footsteps, you had people such as Spinoza, Leibniz, Berkeley, Kant, and ultimately Hegel, uh, who are going to uh, develop this ideal of trying to eliminate doubt and bring about absoluteness and certainty uh, within the world. And it's this tradition that Kierkegaard is basically going to be arguing against. And so before we can really delve into Kierkegaard proper, we need to look at George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who lived from 1770 to 1831. Uh, Hegel argued that our particular ideas and our way of thinking were historically conditioned, and they constituted a product of our time. Now, I would not argue about this point, but he does go on to say that history is constantly moving forward in a particular direction, and this constant change is driven by an engine that he calls a dialectic. Immanuel Kant had argued that reason and desire were in conflict with each other, and that that conflict was inevitable. Hegel countered that thought throughout the course of time. He says that the conflict could and ultimately would be resolved. In fact, he says it had already been resolved by Socrates, who helped to develop the idea of an individual conscience, when the questions rather than just accepts ideas. In its basic historical form, we can see a cyclical movement. At each stage, internal contradictions and conflicts are resolved to produce a new higher form of society. Now, in order to try to explain this, we need to look into his work, uh, which you see on the screen here, Phenomenology des Geistes, the uh, phenomenology of mind, spirit, ultimate reality, uh, to understand what this engine is <clears throat> that he is talking about. And so we have a relatively crude drawing being presented here. But in essence, Hegel is going to argue that throughout the course of history, dialectic is going to continue to move mankind forward until we possess the absolute knowledge of all things. For Hegel, when, when Geist derives at absolute knowledge, this will be the culmination of history. The knowledge that Geist is reality and that history is the unfolding of its own inherent rationality, that is the end point. Now, to help us understand this, we'll take a very simple example here. Um, and this is a terrible example, but it's one that really, I think, gets the idea crossed. Let's imagine that we have this basic spot right here, and we're going to call that our thesis position. And this over here we'll call our antithesis position. Now, suppose that someone has spilled something on the carpet, and person one here looks at it, that's our thesis view, and says that's a red spot on the carpet. But person two over here says, no, that's a blue spot on the carpet. Now, we have opposing viewpoints, and what ultimately needs to happen is an Aufhebung, a synthesis between the two that yields a new perspective. This one says it's red, this one says it's blue, so through that synthesis, we would find that it's actually closer to purple. Okay. Again, that's a terrible example. It's not really the way it works, but it gets the idea crossed. Uh, to give you something more akin to the way that it would work, let's imagine that our thesis position is a very conservative 1950s Eisenhower America, uh, in which men wear suits and women wear dresses and uh, we're coming out of the war and you've got a relatively conservative Protestant church-going crowd of people. But into this, we get a counterculture that emerges. Initially, the beatniks come on the scene. Later, you get the hippies. Uh, and their view is radically different from that of this earlier Eisenhower crowd. And so what's going to happen? Well, historically, there was a clash between these two cultures, and it was a violent clash. But the end result was a synthesis between the two. When we look at our society today, although there are people on the fringes of either side, mainstream society is no longer 
the conservative suit-wearing society of the 50s, nor was it the running around naked in the street, hate ashbury crowd of the 60s. We found a happy medium between those two through that aufhebung. And this is the way the dialectic is going to continue to work. That has become our new thesis, which will eventually be challenged by another view, forcing another aufhebung, and so on and so on and so forth, until we reach this point of absolute vision, this point of absolute knowledge, where all things are as they are intended to be. Uh, but this is a process that um, Hegel says usually comes with regards to violence. And so the th thesis view is going to clash with the, uh, the um, antithesis view, and they're going to clash usually violently, but in the end result, there is going to be an improvement or a movement towards that ultimate reality, towards that Geist. And uh, so this is the process that Hegel argues for, which is very much in the tradition of Descartes. And it demonstrates the fact that, uh, that there should be an absolute knowledge that we are simply waiting to discover. But this is what Kierkegaard is ultimately going to be arguing against. Um, this is, he calls it a blind alley, a blind alley of absolutes and objective truth. And so he's going to be rejecting this notion because for Kierkegaard, knowledge is not absolute. It's not moving towards an absolute truth. It is purely subjective. Now, Kierkegaard is considered the father of a movement that is called existentialism. Existentialism is a uh, tradition that really, in many ways, goes back to Socrates and Plato. But it's considered primarily a 20th century uh, tradition. But in hindsight, people have gone back and said, Kierkegaard is really the modern founder of this movement. Jean-Paul Sartre, who lives from 1905 to 1980, is the French philosopher for whom the idea or the term existentialism was actually created. Um, Gabriel Marcel, the historian, actually came up with the term. So it was created in the 1940s, but it was applied to Kierkegaard. It was applied to a handful of other figures along the way. Uh, some noted figures who are considered existentialist, of course, Soren Kierkegaard is considered the father of this movement, but also the Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, who has the very impressive mustache there, uh, Martin Heidegger, Martin Buber, Albert Camus, Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, these individuals are all under the guise of being existentialists. They all share these same basic beliefs. One of the things I want you to note with regards to this is that many people believe that the existentialist movement must naturally be an atheistic movement. And it is true that the vast majority of existentialists were also atheists. However, there are some notable exceptions. Soren Kierkegaard is one of those. And uh, Martin Buber, who wrote from a Jewish perspective, was another. So although it's probably easier to be an existentialist as an atheist, it's not by any means a requirement. So what is existentialism? Here's a basic definition. Existentialism is concerned with showing the individual in concrete situations in the world and noticing how the individual handles those situations as an individual. So, in terms of existentialism, you're not looking at grand overarching theories. You are looking at one person put into a solitary situation and making a choice in that moment. In many ways, as um, Sartre is ultimately going to say, what we have in existentialism is almost a form of psychoanalysis because it's not going to give us absolutes. It's not going to give us, here's how you should act in this situation. What it's going to do is give us an opportunity to look back in hindsight and say, here's how we got to where we are.
And that's really all that we can do with regards to it. Um, every situation in the world is unique and different. Every person in the world is unique and different. So every individual will handle the situation that they're thrust into in their own way. And all we can do is look back in hindsight and say, how did this person handle that situation? How did that turn out for them? Is there a better way perhaps we think it may have played out? This is what existentialism can do, but it's very much concerned with that individual in the moment. Now, when we talk about existence within the confines of existentialism, there are a few things that we need to keep in mind, and these are concepts that come directly from Kierkegaard, even though, again, it's, it's Sartre who really builds with them and, and develops them and so on. The basic ideas are found within Kierkegaard. Existence refers only to human existence. Even though there are countless things in this universe that exists, tables, chairs, uh, trees, plants, aardvarks, elephants, uh, all of these things exist. But when we talk about existence in the existential sense, we're only talking about human existence. And more specifically, existence really only refers to that part of human existence which distinguishes it from the being of everything else. In other words, we have to consider what is it that makes us separate from everything else. I mean, really, the big sin of existentialism is to think about human existence as being like the kind of existence enjoyed by other things. And so how is it that humans are different? Well, there's two reasons, again, coming straight from Kierkegaard. Human existence has a care for itself. Of all the things that exist, the human being is the only one who questions its existence, who ponders if there's a meaning or purpose to their existence, who wonders if there's anything beyond this world. Now, of course, this probably comes down to the fact that humans are the ones who have language to be able to develop these ideas within. But still, the very fact that we are concerned with our own existence is crucial. And finally, an existing individual is constantly in the process of, become, of becoming. We are never complete. As individuals, we are always developing ourselves, creating ourselves in the moment based upon the choices and the decisions that we have made. We have a tendency a lot of times to sort of put ourselves into this situation where we put ourselves into a category and we say simply, oh, I'm a student, I'm an instructor, I'm a ball player, you know, whatever. But in doing so, we are not being true to ourselves because we're transforming ourselves into a mere thing, as if that's the only thing that we've ever been, as if that's the only thing we're ever going to be. And that's not the case, because what we are changes based upon what we're doing in that moment. And we are many things at once. But the one thing we know is that we are never complete. As long as we are alive, as long as we are making choices, we are creating ourselves through that activity. And this notion leads to the big phrase of existentialism. Existence precedes essence. What a person is at any given time is essence is always a function of what he is on his way to becoming in pure pursuit of the projects issuing from a reflective concern for his life. So what a person is depends upon existence and in the sense of where that person is on their journey of becoming. So existence precedes essence. The fact that you exist comes before what you are. And this means ultimately that the only thing that you are not responsible for is your own existence. You are here. You exist because of the choices made by other people. But everything from that moment of your birth on, you are responsible for and you alone. And this leads to another important concept of existentialism, dreadful freedom. 
we have a tendency to think very highly of the idea of freedom. Uh, people fight wars over free freedom. Uh, pe people sing songs about freedom. We want freedom. But yet Sartre refers to it as dreadful freedom. Why? Well, because it means that you have taken full responsibility for yourself. You've taken full responsibility for your actions, for your life. There are no scapegoats. We can't blame genetics. We can't blame our environment. Each person is responsible for every choice and every decision that they make. And so if you don't like what's happening in your life, if you don't like where you are, there is no one to pass the buck to. It is your fault. It is your responsibility because you and you alone make these choices and these decisions. Now, it is true that these choices you're going to make are going to be based upon where you're thrust. And so um, one of the examples that Sartre gives, let's imagine that you've chosen to enter the military and your commanding officer has made a decision that your troops are going to march into battle the next day. The odds are not good. It doesn't look very promising like you're going to walk out of this alive. So you have a choice to make because of the choice that was made by your commanding officer. Are you going to march into that battle with your regiment, potentially putting your life on the line? Or are you going to refuse to do that, which will ultimately lead to probably a court-martial? Um, neither one sounds like good options, but it's still your choice which one you're going to take. So in essence, you are responsible for all of the decisions, all of the choices. There's no way to pass the buck. And that's what's meant by dreadful freedom. So this is really what it implies to be an existentialist. It is to be that person who takes full and complete responsibility for their own life. That person who is interested in making choices and making decisions and hopefully trying to figure out how to make the best choices. But knowing that since everything is unwritten, since the future is contingent, since everything is down to a matter of subjectivity, there is no conceivable way for you to not be responsible. You can't know for sure what's the right course of action, but you can make the best decision and you can take the time to go back in hindsight and consider it. And so these are the ideas of existentialism and this is ultimately uh, where Kierkegaard is gonna come from. So let's go ahead and take a look at Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, which is the way you'd pronounce it in the Danish, or Kierkegaard is the way we tend to say it, uh, lived from 1813 to 1855. He was born in Copenhagen, Denmark. He was the youngest of seven children. His father, Michael, was an indentured laborer for the Danish church, what was called the Kirke, uh, and he was provided part of the church's farm, uh, which was called Gard, for his family's use, and that's where the name comes from, basically church farmer, Kirke Gard. Uh, anyway, Michael, his father, went to live with a wealthy uncle at the age of 12. And he put him on this path towards prosperity, and he was able to retire very well off at the age of 40. Now, despite this, Michael was very religiously angst-ridden, very guilty, very melancholy, and he passed this mentality on to his children. All, uh, all of Kierkegaard and his brothers uh, and sisters had you know, real problems with bouts of depression, with melancholia and things of that nature. Um, one of his sisters committed suicide. Uh, Kierkegaard was probably the most cheerful of the group, quite honestly. Well, he will attend the University of Copenhagen, where he studies philosophy and literature. Initially, his idea was to enter into the clergy, but he decided against it, saying that he was too committed to take the vows. Now, this seems rather strange. I mean, if somebody is committed to their faith, how can they be too committed to take the vows, to, to enter the clergy? Well, Kierkegaard's point is that 
what's happened is that the church has sort of lost or moved away from the spiritual dimension. It's become objectified into a thing. Instead of being the pure, flowing, subjective uh, connection between God and the individual that it should be, it's become a list of rules and regulations. It's become a catalog of lit litanies. And these things many times are said without thought or without concern. It's going through the motions of faith of something that has become, you know, just sort of the commonplace, here's what we do, All right? It's, it's rut, it's routine. And so he feels that because his faith is so strong, he doesn't want to be part of something that's objectifying faith. In 1840, he begins a courtship with a young woman called Regine Olson, and from the letters that have survived, it seems that they were very much in love. Uh, they, they became engaged, but after about a year, Soren broke off the engagement, and the reason was almost identical to why he wouldn't take the vows. Kierkegaard basically says that if I allow myself to become attached to this person, then I'm grounding myself in this one particular view. I am grounding myself to this position or to this perspective. I am objectifying my existence instead of allowing it to remain the subjective entity. Hopefully, by the time we get done with the uh, discussion of the book, this will make a little bit more sense to you. Now, Kierkegaard writes almost continuously for about 15 years. And during that time, it's just a small sample of the books that he writes, but he has a tendency to uh, write under a pseudonym. And, uh, you know, of course, these volumes all have Kierkegaard's name on them now, but when he was originally publishing them, Kierkegaard was listed as the editor, he was listed as the publisher, the, the actual author was always a pseudonym of some sort that had something to do with the book that you're dealing with. So in the case of Fear and Trembling, for example, he writes under the name of Johannes de Silentio, John the Silent. And again, once you see the basic message behind the Fear and Trembling, you'll understand how very apt that title or that name is. Uh, but anyway, he, he, it's amazing the amount of work that he does uh, in, in only 15 years' time. So it's, it's pretty incredible. Towards the end of his life, he is going to begin a rather vicious attack on the Church of Denmark, uh, arguing about corruption that existed within the Church, as well as dogmatic practices. For him... Religion is about personal relationship. It's subjective, it's not objective. And this leads to his claim that he was the only real Christian in all of Denmark. Kierkegaard makes that claim on several occasions, that he is the only true Christian in all of Denmark, because he is the only one that recognizes that direct, personal, subjective connection between himself and the divine, Everyone else, like we talked about before, is going through the motions. Well, Kierkegaard dies in 1855 at the age of 42, and his death is somewhat mysterious. Um, Bishop Minster was one of the central figures. He was the head of the Church of England during much of the time that Kierkegaard was arguing uh, Minster does die before Kierkegaard does, so we can't lay this mysterious death directly at his uh, feet. But nonetheless, it does seem at least plausible that because of these attacks that Kierkegaard was becoming more and more relentless with against the church, that someone within the hierarchy of the Danish church could have uh, led to his early demise. We have no direct evidence, but there has been quite a bit of supposition over the years because of that. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into Fear and Trembling itself, uh, which was published in 1843. 
In the preface, we are introduced to this author, Johannes de Silentio, John the Silent. And it says he is no philosopher. He's not understood the system. He doesn't even know if there really is one or if it's been completed. And what he's doing here is referencing Hegel's great system, which, of course, Kierkegaard discounts. And so John the Silent is going to take us into a lot of the same history with regards to Descartes and Hegel and this 400-year-long cul-de-sac that we've gone down in his opinion. During this time, we see him ridiculing these systems, making fun of them. There is a lot of humor. If you know where to look for it, there's a lot of humor in Kierkegaard's writing. And so just as an example here, as far as his own weak head is concerned, the thought of what huge heads everyone must have in order to have such huge thoughts is already enough. Uh, that in and of itself is interesting because when he's talking about the weak heads and huge heads and so on, he is referring to a science or more of a pseudoscience that was prevalent at his time um, in which people believed, it's called phrenology, uh, in which people believed that the size of an individual's head, their skull capacity, led directly to their intelligence level. And so individuals who have larger heads would have greater intelligence. And so what if you were somebody like Descartes or Hegel who believed that we could know everything, that we could possess absolute knowledge of all things? Well, if such an individual really were to exist, imagine what a massively huge head that individual would have to have, right? Our own heads are so small, so insignificant. How can they hold anything? So he's making fun of the science of the day at the same time. He's making fun and ridiculing this 400-year-long tradition that runs from Descartes to Hegel. In an age where passion has been done away with for the sake of science, he easily foresees his fate. In an age when an author who wants readers must be careful to write in a way that he can be comfortably leafed through during an after-dinner nap and be sure to present himself to the world like the polite gardener's boy in the advertiser who had in hand and with good references from his previous place of employment recommends himself to a much-esteemed public, he foresees his fate will be to, complete, uh, to be completely ignored." Towards the bottom of that passage, I prostrate myself before any systematic bag searcher. This is not the system. It hasn't the slightest thing to do with the system. I wish all good on the system and on the Danish shareholders in that omnibus, for it will hardly become a tower. I wish them good luck and I prostrate uh, and, and prosperity one and all. Respectfully, Johannes de Silentio. And so again, he is prostrating himself. He is saying, look, I'm not a philosopher. I don't understand this system. Uh, those of you who have big enough heads to be able to, uh, to, to, to handle that, then I, I wish all good luck on you. But this system is not going to become a tower. What does he mean by that? Well, in Luke chapter 14, uh, we hear about a man who has this idea where he's going to build this tower that's able to reach up and touch the heavens. And he puts everything he has into it, and he starts building this tower, but he runs out of money and has to stop. And for the rest of his life, that start of the tower is going to sit there, and it's going to mock him, it's going to ridicule him throughout all of this, uh, all of this time. So this individual uh, is unable to complete his task. And this is basically what Kierkegaard is saying through this analogy to uh, Luke chapter 14. He's saying that those people like Hegel and Descartes and others, they can get on to this path and they can start moving in, in a certain direction, but they're never going to be able to complete the tower because there is no end to where we're going. There is no end point. There is no stopping point. 
you know, building the tower to reaching up to the heavens, well, maybe we could say we could build it high enough to reach atmosphere, uh, stratosphere, you know, whatever. But there might be a stopping point there if we could actually achieve it. But heaven itself is, you know, somewhere beyond. You're never going to reach it. And likewise, because our knowledge is constantly evolving, moving, changing, it's never going to be absolute. It's never going to be complete. And so there's no way to end what you have started. This is really the curse of the system. A person like Descartes, they can find the foundation, cogito ergo sum. They can start to build, but maybe laziness pulls them back to their old ways and they fail to finish. Or you might be somebody like Hegel, who begins by identifying the system within history but the system is never going to be finished because the world does not have objective absolutes within it. There is not an end to our inquiry, so it can never be finished. Why? Because the objective exists outside of you. It exists outside of the individual. The Hegelian wants to find these abstract timeless categories but as a result, he loses the individual as a concrete temporal existent. Kierkegaard's conception of truth is subjective, so there is no system. There is no tower. There is only the individual in the moment. And these are the ideas that John the Silent will present as we make our way through the fear and trembling. And so we will move into that in our next video.